Hello! Welcome to I... Macrobiology Twitter Journal Club. Well, not Twitter Journal Club, we're on YouTube currently, but that was what we were originally. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> my name is Faz Alam. You can still reach us on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're also on Twitter. We, and... we have our Twitter bios. Uh... <laughs> And, and my name is Danny. Yeah, we're both <laughs> microbiology PhDs with an interest in in all the sorts of things related to microbiology. But we've been focusing mostly on COVID for the past few months because that's the big microbiology story, and we all want to know how to exist in life post COVID. So for us, it's all understanding the disease and understanding how it works, and figure, and looking at some of the rate latest research that's coming out about it. Yeah, um, the format that we normally do is that uh, one week we choose the papers and talk about some news topics, and then the next week we dive into a paper that we chose and go figure by figure and talk about what we're learning. Um, and I think it's been really good. I mean, I've, I've learned so much about <laughs> COVID-19, and I mean, this paper, I've learned tons about immunology. Yeah, so yeah, this week we, we're going into a deep, deep dive into a paper that focuses on the immunology, how the immune, immune system reacts to covid and, mm -hmm. and yeah, this has been quite, so the title of the paper is Loss of Germinal Centers in Severe COVID-19 Infect, oh, hold on a minute, sorry. Loss of BCL6 expressing T follicular helper cells and germinal centers in COVID-19. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, this is an interesting one because it focuses in on that immune reaction and like what, so when you have patients who have severe like coronavirus, what, what went wrong with their immune response? Like why? Yes. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Which, but I think more even, even not severe, right? They're they don't only look at. I mean, they, they look, yeah, they look, they look at other things, but I mean, the the first few pages are about patients who have died about of COVID. So the, a lot of this data <clears throat> comes from patients who <clears throat> who died from COVID, and and they're they're yep. like uh, various. The, the, yeah, their the their patient data was used for this uh, study. Um, yeah, I, I think one of the th reasons we chose this paper uh, last week was because they actually have these human biopsies, yeah. right? So we're looking at samples from individuals, um, and in, in in immunology, that's a big mm. deal because, like, there are these subtle differences between mice and humans, and so like it's always nice. Um, sort of there's an interplay right like if you find something in your human samples then you know how you might try to model it in mice with all the caveats of a mouse um and like discovering things in mice you have to then like confirm that you see that thing in humans so you, it's, this is like always a big part of the puzzle um because you can get to certain types of experimental manipulations in this model right like knocking out a gene seeing the the use of that the, like um yeah, the role of that gene product, um, but you can't get that in human samples. Yeah. <laughs> um, so like, there's always that back and forth um, when you're discovering this stuff. And and this one happens to be all human stuff. So, you know, basically in the in the discussion, they'll say, well, we should follow that up with like a mouse model, maybe. <laughs> yeah, this is because this really this paper talks about the real complexities of the immune system. About so we're going to be going in quite mm -hmm. deep and talking about a lot of different cells, and it's. Yeah, and it's got a lot of wider implications uh, that I think are, we know are immediately relevant because they're in humans. So, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. I like that that the observations here you don't really have to pass through the filter of well, does that even happen? Well, they're trying, they're they're doing their work to try to show you it does yeah. <laughs> happen in humans. Yeah, that's they know it happens in humans. Therefore, it's going to, therefore they're going to understand. It's going to be. Yeah, they're, they're showing <laughs> that it happens and the why it happens and how they've done a little bit in that, but obviously there's going to, there's a lot of stuff that can still be done, it's, and always with science. Oh yeah, I mean you can see that in the you can see that in the graphical abstract. I think the fact that other immunogens or like SARS-CoV-2 and other immunogens, they're like this part of the graph or this part of the chart like at the left, um, and there's like nothing connecting it to the rest. Right? Yeah, <laughs> like <laughs> we know this stuff happens. <laughs> But like they're not showing us like from those points what's touching the immune system. They like in these things that <laughs> stuff goes on. Like okay, we're gonna look at the immune system. That's the focus. Yes. So if you want to read along, we've got the link up to the paper in the description, the DOI code, so you can have the paper along with us and pause if there's something that confuses you because that's what I had to do when I was reading this paper because there's quite a lot in it. Uh, I think we can start with talking about a little bit about uh, germinal centers and what they are. 
Yeah, let's. Let's. <laughs> so, uh, let's. Um, I mean, uh, would you like to start? I... Oh, sure. I was just going to say, I was recounting this to somebody this week. I was saying, you know, it's, it's very cool to think about organs, right? Like, um, organs are like uh, organs from hmm. tissues, right? That like increasing complexity, right? That like tissues are these, like they're cells and they kind of different cells do different things. You put them together in a certain organization, they make a tissue, right? And then those tissues come together in a certain organization and they make an organ. Um, and the immune system uh, is like all the, there's all these different types of cells. I mean, even for people who don't study the immune system, we know like B cells, T cells, you've heard those terms, right? Antibodies, maybe you've heard immune versus adaptive immune system. All those are different types of cells, but the tissues that they come together and the organs that they come together in are like, big parts of the way they work um, because for the cells to signal properly to do the right things, they have to meet the right cells and get the right signals. Um, and the, the story is very tangential. The story that I was telling a friend is that these germinal centers, I love that they, they're these complex organizations of cells and ultimately they're about um, making anti antibodies. Yeah. Right. Um, but they appear inside of an organ sort of out of nowhere, if, if that makes any sense. Like they are they are the constructions of complexity. The first things that come together, you have this like region of a lymph node or a spleen or something. And when the right cells come together, they start building a structure. And like I, I, I really like that's like a really interesting way of thinking about organs or, or tissues. Right. Because you think of them as pre-existing <laughs> like things in your body that you dissect out. And like, yes, these are pre-existing things in your body, but they can also just develop, right, yeah. uh, as needed. And that's a really important feature of the immune system, um, that things develop as needed, <laughs> because, or that's a good feature of, like, adaptive immunity, right? Yeah. Like, you don't, it's not always on, it has to develop from somewhere. Yeah, that, and the germinal center is exactly one of the best examples of these transient kind of immune uh, clusters. So, mm -hmm. um, so I guess what happens, like, so what I learned when, 10 years ago when I was doing immuno immunology was that, okay, you have a B cell that's, that, that, so all B cells are kind of like generated in the bone marrow and there's this, mm -hmm. and they have these receptors that are almost randomly generated with an RNG sort of uh, kind of idea that they're, they're produced mm -hmm. and then they're only activated if they have, if they, they're, if they're, if they have the B cell receptor in the Goldilocks zone where they're, they react to stuff, they don't react to everything. So they don't react to just your own random human cells. They, they're there to react to a pathogen cells, and yeah. But and then once well, yeah. It, 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 in an RNG process, you can imagine there will be things that might recognize you, yeah. but the body trims those off. Yeah, <laughs> ahead of time. Yeah, the body makes sure that those are trimmed off, and mm -hmm. and then then uh, then once you get your B cell and it uh, finds the actual antigen. So when this this B cell is created through a completely randomized process, comes suddenly mm -hmm. comes and finds coronavirus. It, it it needs to expand and develop so it becomes better at like recognizing coronavirus and be better at producing antibodies against it. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. the actual like process for this it, it doesn't just happen now out, out of nowhere. It happens in these things called germinal centers, and it's really tightly yeah. regulated by. Uh, so I mean, and you can imagine why tightly regulated. I think when we chose this paper, I was like BCL six. I've heard of that. That's like some sort of cancer thing, yeah. right? But like anything that deals with proliferation, right? Like we're saying that you have a random assortment of cells. You have to choose. Your body has to be able to choose one of them and say this is the one that's going to grow, right? And and keep going. You know, you have to regulate that very tightly because if that was uncontrolled, you get cancer, and that is the case, right? Like yeah. defects in. BCL6 leads to types of lymphomas. Yeah, BCL6 <laughs> literally stands for, I think, B-cell lymphoma, lymphoma, which <laughs> is just... Oh, we've named it after the disease. <laughs> yeah, that's what happens to, to most things. So, I mean, yeah, most genes are named after lymphoma or something like that. They're, they're too with some growth like factor. It's usually tightly regulated in cells, but suddenly when it when it messes up, it causes you gives you cancer. So mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. is an example of that. Um, and, and this is, a, I think this is a, a good point um, to, to talk about now is that uh, so they have this 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 process of like choosing the right ones to develop right happens in the germinal centers. That's ultimately I, I like to think of the immune system as like passing off information from different steps, yeah. right? Like the germinal center is this zone of like information pass off because B cells by themselves 
can't be sure that the antigen that or like the that the receptor on them right is the right one like how do you how does the body know yeah. <laughs> that something is wrong um and like that this thing that they're showing you right is a dangerous antigen um and so there's there's a pass off of information from uh, different types of immune surveillance cells, right? Yeah. Antigen presenting cells, yeah. um, T cells, even, yeah. right? I think there's an interplay before uh, between certain antigen presenting T cells, and people talk about um, sort of what, like the second signal <laughs> yeah. for proliferation a lot, um, both in adaptive and innate, and like uh, we'll see that pattern. I think always that pattern like occurs a lot in the immune system's organization. Yeah. Um, that y you can't just show one thing and say that, okay, this is the reason, th this is enough signal for the cells to go down a path. There's usually like a, another check and balance to make sure it doesn't progress um, unless you're absolutely sure that's the right thing. Yeah, immune system, they're doing two-factor <clears throat> authentication way before Google. Yeah. They, yeah. <laughs> they have that. They knew the, the what would go wrong. Yeah. They, so, I mean, you have your, your antigen, so I think dendritic cells are the main antigen presenting cells in these sorts of situations where... They yes, kind of yes. go to areas of like where of the body that are damaged. They hoover up a bunch of stuff, so they, they know that something's mm -hmm. causing damage. So they hoover up, and then mm -hmm. they go to den, to like the the lymph node and go like basically go to the groups of B cells that are there and be like, "Have you seen this? Have you seen this?" And and right. in that process, there's like a T cell that's like managing that. There's a couple of T helper cells that help to manage that process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's the T cells that verify against the dendritic cell, yeah. and then, <laughs> and then the T cells are able to move into these. Um, like, there's a yeah, they're able to move into the lymph nodes and interact with the B cells that are there. <laughs> yeah, and and then they can give the B cells that kind of link and say like, hey, this is something that. Of course, this is all not said in English. It's all said through chemical signals. So yes, so like the yes. The B cell so those are the cyto cytokines yeah. and receptor ligand interactions. Yeah, and the B cells. Uh, I think the B cell six it basically represses a bunch of different like proteins, uh, the different the, the, a bunch of genes in in the B cells. And then once it, it once that's activated, it kind of like lets go, because it, usually it just sits on some DNA and stops anything from reading it. And then once it once it's off, anything can go. And then it starts doing all of these other things like uh, somatic homopathy mutation, which is well, which is really interesting, where they have an antibody that already binds to something, but then they try to select for a better one by causing these randomized little mutations in that particular area of the gene to find things that mm -hmm. bind better and kind of tune the... So BCL6 is, is both in B cells and T yes, cells. Yes, that's right. <laughs> right, I think that that's something that is important to note. Um, so in, in B cells, they... So, I guess maybe we should talk about what a germinal center is. Yeah, uh, so yeah, <laughs> right. germinal centers. So uh, that. So let me see. I, I did find the definition on on Wikipedia, oh. but. Uh... Uh, okay. I mean, I'll say I'll say what I think. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> uh, I would say like there are locations inside of lymph nodes. So like the lymph node is the organ, <laughs> and the tissue normally has. I guess you have a picture right now yeah. of a lymph node up. I have right? a picture of them, um, and in the like kind of. Inside of the inside of them, there are different lobes, and in those, there are like lighter purple centers that represent the general centers. So, mm -hmm. there's, in general, centers, yeah, so, so those those lobes are just full of B cells, and I think follicular dendritic cells yeah. are like the common types of cells that make up those cortexes. Yeah, um, and blood, or like right, there's some interplay between blood and lymph, where lymph is kind of like another back way yeah. of moving around that immune cells have access to so like in the blood immune cells can transmit between the blood and the lymphatic tissue mm. um and then so once they get into the lymph then they have access to this space um where the b cells are hanging out in <laughs> most yeah. most b cells there's a high density of them um and so if a t cell had identified something right at a infectious site in the blood um maybe it found it in the tissue and it had to migrate into the blood and came out whatever Right. It's it's like it has a something to bring to the B cells to see um, and the B cells will pick up on that uh, and then start creating this organization, this germinal center uh, where the primary purpose is to, as you said, the somatic hypermutation. Yes. Right. So choose the B cell that has that the RNG B cell from when you were born, <laughs> uh, choose the one that has the uh, uh, 
uh, B cell receptor, which is ultimately going to become the antibody, right? The receptor on the outside of that cell that recognizes the antigen best mm. is set through a, is sent through another cycle of mutation, so that maybe you'll find one that uh, hits it better, and that will continue um, for some amount of time, and uh, just depending on sort of reinforcement, continuously seeing those antigens appear in the blood, mm. right? And so. Um, I think that that's the important role of follicular dendritic cells in this whole organization is that your body has to be inundated with this antigen, right? For yeah. it, like, first it has to recognize, there has to be that initial recognition. T help, T helper cell has to say, this is a problem, right? Like we, we heard it from the dendritics that this is a problem. We brought it to the, um, B cell, we brought it to the lymph node so that B cells can have a crack at it. Uh, the germinal center gets formed, and then there's constant reinforcement by the presence of that antigen presented by follicular <laughs> dendritic cells inside of that germinal center to say, uh, yes, the things that you're making, we still want more of those B cells. <laughs> um, and, and it's sort of simple. Like if the follicular dendritic cells, they present everything they see actually um, inside of the blood. And so if the B cells don't continuously reckon, aren't being continuously stimulated to say like, yes, I still see this, this still exists in the blood, they will die uh, because you don't want them to go on and just grow, right? Like this is that idea, like you want to tightly control their growth. So only if the antigen continuously is like being presented, will you get continuous proliferation of this subset of cells, yeah. the B cells. And that all happens in the germinal center. Um, Oh, and I guess they look very specific, right? They have a light and a dark yes. zone. <laughs> That's how I guess they were originally described histologically when they sliced up lymph yeah, nodes. They... Um, yeah, that, that's. It just looks light and dark based on H and E staining. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean a lot of uh, uh, stuff like that is the, the core of like all cell biology is like starting off by looking. This looks a bit different, and then drilling down from there, and then finding out the characteristics right. of that. The the, the like, so I think. Like the dark cell has a lot more like uh, B cells in it. I'm let me check. I think the cells are cycling. I think B cells are cycling between the light and dark zones. That that's my understanding. Yeah. In one zone, they're proliferating, <laughs> and it they're oh no. In one zone, they're mutating. They're doing their hyper somatic hypermutation, and in the other zone, they're touching follicular um, dendritic cells. And if they if they stick, then they don't die. <laughs> <laughs> but if they stick, they die. Um, so then the ones that stick, after they've received enough time, once they've gotten the pat on the head, the approval to <laughs> to go back into the next zone, to go back into the light or dark, I don't recall which one they moved to, so, then they will go back and they will start mutating again. So yeah, I checked on, I, don't, I checked my notes. It's uh, the dark zone is where the clonal expansion occurs, where all the, the, the naive T cells, go, B, sorry, naive B cells go in and they expand and the light zone is where they encounter the they they are selected out by the bees and uh, by the T cells. I, I need to gotcha. Yeah, so uh, and that's when the the things like class switching. That's when you see uh, memory uh, B cells start to appear as well in plasma cells. Um, mm -hmm. So the plasma cells are the ones that are dedicated to pumping out antibody. Memory B cells are there just to remember, so that they can deal with the infection in the future. Yeah. So uh, yeah, the the end goal of all of this is that the the antigen recognizes dangerous, right? That was presented to the germinal center. Um, you're going to get plasma cells coming out of that that have high affinity antibodies. Those are the antibody makers. And then hopefully also memory so that the next time you get this, this whole selection process doesn't have to happen anymore, right? That yeah. like the next time it's like, it's not like you need present, you don't need the same type of presentation and selection. It's just, oh, the B cells are already around. Let's expand that compartment. Yeah. Uh, I think that's basically covered uh, quite a lot of the, the, most of the background I think we need for this. I mean, there's... Yeah. Ooh, I guess um, maybe it's good to talk about the TH1 versus TH2 axis uh, in all yeah. of this. The TH1... So, so like... Cell-based um, versus humoral, I guess. Is yeah. Right. Cell-based versus humoral. So these germinal centers, uh, it's definitely part of a TH2-style response. <clears throat> yeah. right which is humoral immunity right yeah. we're talking about antibodies and we actually covered a paper right like uh, maybe like a couple weeks ago right about th1 response that's cellular immunity yeah 
Um, and so cellular immunity works through CD8 uh, T cells. Mm -hmm. uh, they're basically the things that survey cells and be like, oh, you are making something strange inside of you. Uh, time to die. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, so there, and I think when we discussed that paper, we even said like, oh, that makes a lot of sense when you think about mm -hmm. viruses, right? Because viruses like are going, are being made inside of cells. So you get this like surveillance from them. Um, but, you know, antibodies are, may also be important because they can block the viruses from even attaching yeah. in the first place. Um, and so the body has these two arms. They're theoretical. Oh, right? yeah. like, this is like from from the years of speaking and um, different scientists hypothesizing over the data that they have. Right. People are like, OK, this is a good model. Yeah. It sort of describes like two arms of how we could see responses. But really, there's interplay oh, between yeah. them, right? Like, you don't have 100%. If you have antibodies, you don't have yeah. no cellular immunity. If you have no cellular immunity, you don't have no antibodies. And antibodies can play a role in, you know, um, sense of, like, like driving more antibodies or even driving more cellular immunity. So there's like a, this yeah, big it's, it's it's <laughs> reality is much more complicated. Because I remember when I started, when I actually <laughs> learned immunology, they're only TH1 and TH2. But then they discovered TH17, which is to, to do with like immunity on surfaces on on, on mucosa, which is like the kind of internal like yeah like tonsils like lungs tissue tissue, tissue surfaces yeah. yeah I feel like I, I I um when I learned about that one back in the day it's inter it, like it makes a lot of sense because you know uh it, it, I think part of that research came from uh, the question of why don't you have immune responses to your food that you yeah. eat? <laughs> right? Like, because food is foreign, yeah. right? Like, shouldn't food, like, cause this inflammatory reaction where your body's like, fight off the food, don't let those food particles get too close to the cells, right? That's foreign. Well, like, those surfaces, right, being exposed to the outside for so long, they have even more immune cells that are sort of suppressing reactions and making, so, yeah, TH17 is like a suppressive arm. Yeah. Um, and originally was described, I think, to sort of <laughs> help smooth over that big yeah. question, like why do we not uh, react to everything? Yeah, I mean, um, and that's a big yeah. story. I, I, that's a theme in immunology. I think that it's good to remember. I don't know if it's going to be super relevant in this paper, but you know, the big challenge of the immune system is finding the bad <laughs> things <laughs> and responding to them while not over responding yeah. to every single thing that's out there <laughs> yeah it's almost as important what, what the immune system doesn't do is almost as important as what it does do uh oh yeah. absolutely yeah and like now there's all these autoimmune diseases and people are like really in the weeds i think or, you know we're sort of in the phase of as we gain more and more information with the immune system everyone wants to throw out their favorite immunomodulatory <laughs> solution to a, a disease process Right, like we see that too in SARS-CoV-2 that people were talking about IL-6 um, antibodies, yes. right, or an IL-10 antibodies totally. as ways of like suppressing um, the disease process. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. And trying to modulate the immune system <laughs> is, I mean, the two big like kind of treatments are like steroids, which uh, like which mm -hmm. modulate the immune system, but like so yeah. exactly what they're doing is is quite difficult to pass out because the immune system is so complicated. And t yeah, yeah, it has like a wide range yeah. of effects. <laughs> and like, look. so I think that's I think that's yeah. important to remember. Like, yeah, so TH1, TH2, humoral versus cellular. Those are just ways of yes. thinking. Same inflammation, pro-inflammatory, right? And and inflammation suppressing, right? Like, those are also just ways of thinking <laughs> about yes. it, right? They're not like you don't just go down the path. It's like inflammation is terrible because it's going down like all these cascades and you're puffing up and whatever, right? Like, it's part of it's just a way of understanding like a general set of pathways that are being um, that are being activated. But uh, the devil is in the details. Your body doesn't want to respond the same way every time to everything because the world is a big, complicated place. So in the immune system, there's a lot of stuff that might go down a path, but then suppresses it later. <laughs> or right, like exploring these things and then like stop others, do this one, um, and then even then. You know, I, people don't know. <laughs> Research keeps going. Yeah, uh, to totally. Uh, so I think yeah. we can. So, so let's, let's dig, dig in. in. Yeah, we should definitely uh, dig in. <laughs> hopefully, we've got enough to, that people have a, that people have an understanding of what we're going to be talking about. Hopefully, so. Right. I mean, the the basic visual abstract describes uh, the the idea that um, patients with COVID nineteen don't produce journal centers, and we're going to see the evidence for that. Um, 
So right away, right <laughs> in one A, one A. So uh, yeah, let's so fig, figure one A. Uh, they they look at like lymph nodes from patients. So who so they, they separate patients from from people who like. So these are all from dead patients, but there are early who died eight days post admission and uh, late who died fifteen to thirty six days post admission and and these are just pictures of the lymph nodes. So one A just shows that the the early lymph node has some structure. Late lymph node doesn't have much structure to it. Uh, mm -hmm. So that is... Yeah, it's the structure that is is characteristic of you know stuff going on in the lymph yeah. nodes, right? These organizations. Yeah, something's <laughs> going down. So we need to find out what that thing is. What is going down mm -hmm. in the lymph nodes? Uh, so <laughs> that brings us to 1B, where we look at uh, late stage lymph nodes versus lymph nodes without any COVID-19, so control lymph nodes. and what mm -hmm. we find is that so the general centers are covered in green uh, I, I believe so that's highlighting uh, uh, green is the b cells and uh orange is bcl6 which highlights uh the general centers so mm -hmm. so we've got like so we see the b cells are kind of in a mess in the late lymph nodes ones whereas in the control they're like kind of in nice kind of balls and then when you look for the bcl6 mm -hmm. that seems to be Com almost completely absent in the late lymph nodes in the COVID-19 infected lymph nodes compared to the controls so yes yeah so late so non-COVID-19 lymph nodes you get those really nice punctate places yep. where the BCL6 is being made and then yeah, you don't see that so by this molecular marker right we're not seeing anything yeah. and, and we didn't I don't think we we kind of diverted about time BCL6 it's both on B cells and T yes. cells um, and it helps them get into these organizations. Yes. Um, it, it sort of, uh, it's a transcription factor. So that means it's like touching DNA and I mean, you, you talked about that. So it governs a lot of different proteins and stuff on the surface. And those proteins are what's driving these cells to ultimately get to where they need to be. Yeah. Um, cause if they don't have it on the surface or if they're not making the right signals, saying the right chemical things, they're not going to find themselves in the right place in the body. They'll just keep floating around and moving as they normally would, whatever that means, because normal is also like relative to what it was before yeah. it expressed BCL6. <laughs> <laughs> uh, ex exactly. <clears throat> um, and, uh, figure... okay. So something's wrong with the germinal centers right off the bat. <laughs> they show us, yeah. uh, um, Figure, I and they to, want to use AID now, right? And see. Yeah, so I <clears> jumped <throat> to figure 1D and E because that looks at, basically takes out, uh, so it basically looks at the number of T cells and B cells and it finds that mm -hmm. uh, they're both really reduced in COVID-19 patients. So the graph's pretty mm -hmm. clear on that. Uh, they, they yeah, call... so here they're using CD3 as like the, the T cell marker and CD19 as the B cell marker. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, so... They they split up into like the early lymph nodes, late lymph nodes, and and okay, we can so see that the C C D uh, three is is still is is around, but like in comparison, the 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 I mean the, the the interesting thing is that um even though like so we're looking at like different lymph nodes and we're comparing them with controls. So uh, the control mm -hmm. B C L six is quite bright. A D is the interesting thing that they find here is A I D is also still there. So th yeah. theoretically, AID is one of the genes that causes that som somatic hypermutation. So if BCL6 isn't active, then that shouldn't really be going on. They, that, the B cells shouldn't be maturing to the point where they're doing that somatic hypermutation. So something unusual is happening if AID is still active. Yeah, well, I mean, it's like uh, the B cells are still, like, they're not... Mm, they're still going through their programming. They're just not in the right spot. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like, and that, I mean, I guess that makes it obviously it's not so crazy because I, I feel like, um, like BCL six, like it doesn't, it doesn't control AID itself. Mm. Right. Uh, I think it's a repressor um, so on AID, I think, uh, it's a repressor, Yeah. <clears throat> but, but just one potential repressor. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's one of <laughs> a, a very complicated signal cascade. So it, yeah. So, it's not the so like, one. there's other right. There's other ways to activate yeah. this somatic hypermutation, and, and that would make sense, right? Like other signals happen, not just one thing in the yeah. body. Um, and BCL6 has that role of of localizing things. So I feel here it's like, yeah, like the location of these cells are disrupted, but their programming still seems to be going. Yeah. Right. Like they're still doing those steps that you would associate with maturing B cells. 
<clears throat> yeah, exactly. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, let's see. We've been so now they quantify that too, right? Yeah, they in... they quantify that G. as well. Uh, so they look. So jumping to F in. And so quantification, and I guess, I don't know if we said, but like, you know, quantification, this is all through biopsy yes. lymph nodes, right, that they're staining with these antibodies to make the colors. Um, and when they quantify, it's like a computer, right? That go, it's, it's number per millimeter squared. Yeah. So it's really just like for every frame, every millimeter, they scan over the whole thing and the computer eye counts the dots. Yeah, like, like again, this is so much better than when I was studying immunology. We had to, had to do that manually, right? <laughs> Which is mm. a real, yeah. real pain. But now we've got like computer vision and computers that can do that stuff, which is really, really good. Yeah, which is great, like because when you think of an image, you don't always think about like it's it can have quantitative information yeah. in it. It just it takes a lot of labor to get at it, and computers have been amazing in this sense in terms of helping yeah. out. Uh, and they also like they look at like two different measurements. There's the total number of like pixels, the total number of cells that ha that are with a marker, and also the total mm -hmm. number of cells related to uh, a, a related marker. So, so. Uh, so I think F shows yep. for B cell six like the absolute numbers, and then the numbers relative to the total amount of B cells there. So yes, uh, yeah. So they do they do a proportional. They give us yeah. the absolute, but they also give the proportional, which is important, right? Because yeah. it could be that all the cells are going away or something. Exactly. Right? And I think that's a, a very important thing that they're doing in that paper because you can because I think you do need both bits of information, and what mm -hmm. they are showing here. Is that like okay? The absolute numbers don't necessarily change that much, but the relative numbers do, and so it's not so much of yeah. the quantity. Of, so I mean, I'm going. So it's not so much of the quantity of an immune reaction; it's the quality. So if you want to boost mm -hmm. your immune system, you want to make mm -hmm. sure that it's the right kind of immune response, or just generically oh, boosting sure. stuff is not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The biggest lie of every like nutraceutical. <laughs> yeah, get rid of nutraceuticals. We're we're, we're coming for you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. What's what's next? Spleen. <laughs> so thing? they have some uh, gross images of, of a spleen. So no. So for people who don't know what spleens are, they are quite an important immune organ. Uh, that that they they clean out the blood, like dead blood, dead blood cells, and and they have quite a lot of uh, immune immune areas, I guess. So they they have hmm. they behave very similarly to like the lymph nodes, and they also get yeah. general centers. Yeah, well, we were sort of talking earlier where right? we said that um, like you need constant reinforcement of antigens that are circling around your body <laughs> yeah. to to maintain proliferation cycles because, you know, you got to control those things. And so it makes sense that if the spleen is going through and filtering a lot of things in the blood, um, it also sort of it's the site of, I guess, a lot of macrophages and dendritic cells that are sampling that blood as well yeah um and you can have the same type of germinal center organization here yeah exactly uh and they talk about um red pulp and white pulp so mm -hmm. white pulp is all the immune cells red pulp is kind of blood and 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 other sorts of stuff and they compare like spleens from from patients who i guess died earlier from the disease and patients who died late and they cut they see that mm -hmm. there is this lot of like the there's a lot of gross red stuff that indicates that there isn't <clears> much like immune. Yeah, or something. not as much white pulp going yeah. on. <clears throat> so, yeah, it's. I mean, again, immunology sometimes is going out and looking all going. Ugh, that looks gross. <laughs> <laughs> well, in some ways, it's like we're just zooming in more and more, right? With exactly. each picture, like okay, from the gross pathology, then the H and E, and now show me the molecular markers in B, and you're like, okay, I can see. Like again, they're using BCL six as that marker to say like, we want to see punctate sections of BCL6 saying that there are those cells expressing it and they're localizing right into these organizations. Yeah. <clears throat> so you've got B where you've got like, oh, this is what what uh, general centers and stuff should look like. And then looking, comparing it with a late COVID-19 patient and suddenly what, where's everything? All the, that nice patterning is gone. Uh, and it's... Yeah. Yeah. So in the control, it's like, I, I feel like this is a, such a great there wasn't that good of a zoomed in image of like, <laughs> like one of these centers here, yeah. but like you can see it's like, it is, it is CD3, right? Those are the T cells Yes. Um, and CD19. Those are the B cells. They're in a cluster right in this organ. And in that BCL6 overlay, there's a punctate region in there, yeah. right? <laughs> that, um, that is the journal. That's the journal yeah. center. That's where the T cells and the B cells are mingling in
in a different way. Um, yeah. Yeah, and it <laughs> and that's what we're gonna definitely shows off. that very well, and that's that's, that's and. And suddenly you've got like, and you can see it in the disease state. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I <laughs> so broken up. Even the like image has scan lines on it, which, uh, which is unfortunate. But anyway, uh, but yeah, no. Oh yeah, well that's that's because that's how the image was made. Right? Oh yeah, like, yeah, that's the they camera. They did high magnification and they moved it across. Yeah, that ca camera artifacts like that pop up. I mean, it happens even on on this stream where sometimes you you you'll see like. <laughs> It, it happens everywhere. I, I hope we're not being scrutinized. Like <laughs> scan lines mean we might be fake. <laughs> oh no, we're part of the fake news cycle. We're not real. <laughs> um, but yeah, so two D and E. That they look at like again uh, B B cells uh, and and T cells in the spleen. Uh, again, mm -hmm. showing a big reduction in COVID nineteen in infected patients. Uh, C. What does C look like? C looks like at the Reduction Bringing in AID again. Yeah, <laughs> and again AID uh, is still there, even though the journal the BCL six isn't. So the... it's just diffuse. Well, I mean yeah. BCL six is there too, right? It's just Ooh, diffuse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Uh, uh, <clears throat> yeah, so it's diffuse and it hasn't got that same kind of structure. And yeah, yeah. So I mean, but I guess like I would say it's still there, but I guess in F they do the quantification, yeah. right? And they say, oh, it's actually there's there's also just less BCL six around. Yes, there's less BCL six, <laughs> but and but also like they make sure because they're since there are less B cells, they also have to make sure that there's less as a ratio of the number of B cells there. Mm -hmm. So if it was just less B cells, then you'd see the in figure like in the second graph in figure F, they'd both be the same, but they're not. So. Yeah. Exactly. But that is the case with AID in G, right? So, like, we, you can't really tell from looking at C. Like, I would just say, like, okay, it's there, but it's diffuse. But, no, actually, like, there's the same amount of AID yeah. <laughs> uh, relative to these these B cells. <clears throat> Which is uh, an inter really interesting because, I mean, yeah. if... So they've seen it in two tissues yeah. now, right? A strange phenomenon where... The germinal center, the, the tissue organization that we think of doesn't really exist, and that's because there's not enough BCL6, and yet we still see some sort of entering somatic hypermutation, right, indicative of having these B cells mature in some way. Um, and we know that, like, those, you know, there's a reason why we have germinal centers, because that brings the right cells together to make a productive response. So something's going wrong here. Um, yep. Yeah. So next we're going to jump to figure S1 with follicular dendritic cells to see what are they doing because they're the other big cell type that are uh, interesting. So they they take in a ger in a germinal center. They're another big component of the exactly. germinal centers. Yeah. So and what they basically find in S1, they don't really explore it too deeply, but they show like two control images and then compare them to uh, one uh, late lymph node and they see that they they basically see yeah. that they see the dendritic cells are not really very different at all in terms of like how they're yeah. how they're presenting. So CD thirty CD thirty five in this case is that marker of dendritic cells. Dendritic cells, and we should have said this maybe at the very beginning at the top of it. But you know, immunology we talked about with flow mm. cytometry, right? Like immunology does relies a lot on like these yeah. markers, <laughs> right? So many people have come before and they choose something that they see on these cells repeatedly, and then that becomes like the proxy. We always see through the lens of that molecular yeah. marker. Um, so yeah, CD35 in this case is important even is important to the cell type, right? As I said, that like they need to show stuff yeah. <laughs> right from the from the blood constantly, and this is the receptor actually that does that. Um, so it's nice. There's like a nice functional uh, <laughs> overlap yeah. here between the marker and 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 the the function. Yeah. Uh, and uh, let me think. So next we're going to three A. Yes. So nothing's happening with the follicular dendritic yeah. cells. It's not because yeah. of them. Dendritic cells did nothing <laughs> that, wrong. That we're not getting the organization. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so three A. We go into T follicular helper cells. The CD four plus and ICOS is the marker for the the follicular helper cells. And mm -hmm. and this goes into so this shows like an overlay and it also shows like the uh, where ICOS is showing up on on cells, I think it's so I didn't so I don't know whether you were mm -hmm. able to interpret what the bottom uh, four images are on this slide. The, o the, the overlay, overlay yeah. that's just that's the yeah. zoom in. I think it's like they're really showing off like an amazing resolution yeah. here, right? Yeah. Like like <laughs> we know that CD4 and ICOS, their cell surface, their cell surface yeah. markers. 
right? Like they, they're expressed on the surface of the cell. DAPI, that's staining the yep. nucleus. I hope people remember. We've said it many times before. Um, and so like they're zooming in here and we're seeing that CD4, ICOS, they're on the same cell, right? They, they encircle the same like punctate uh, DAPI. Um, and, and similarly, they do the same thing with BCL6. Right, that it's like they, these are CD4 cells that have BCL6. So remember, BCL6, that's not a surface, that's in the cell, it's a transcription factor. And you see it fills out the middle as well. So, you know, they're just confirming with us that they have the resolution to do co localization, yeah. um, which I guess technically they should have showed us earlier as well. <laughs> right, like, like that's important to establish, right? Because um, in microscopy, you could imagine like, we're trusting that in these images that they're showing, when you zoom in at that cellular uh, that cellular resolution, that those dots can show us actual localization, right. right? Happening on the same cell, and it's not just because like one splooch like kind of overlap the other splooch, right? Like like there's real shape to these things, and that's helping confirm that these are actual cells. Yes. Um. um... So we're going to be jumping, we're going to keep on the CD4 plus ICOS with uh, 3C, uh, which also looks uh, like um, the near naive slash earlier, so this is going to be in the spleen. Uh, again, they, they can kind of confirm the same things are happening in the spleen and in the lymph nodes. And then Yeah, jumping... so they're seeing, so ICOS is the follicular, right, is, is, uh, it's part of the follicular helper program. Yes. Uh, and maybe that comes up as well. And we alluded to that when we talked about TH1 and TH2. Probably should have said it explicitly there. But um, the reason why these, these, um, these theories on how things work are so, well, are, are so well accepted is because they generally track to transcription factors that, like, that activate the whole program of things. Um, and so ICOS is one of those, uh, is one of the things that like, yeah, there's like a whole, or BCL6 is like, there's a whole program, um, yeah. and ICOS is like a marker that comes out of that. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. Um, got 3E and 3G, which are again looking at ICOS and looking at kind of total numbers versus uh, uh, other numbers. Uh, let me see whether I've got this right on here. All right, yeah, so the so numbers per millimeter plus percentage, and then comparing them in the, in the spleen and the lymph nodes. Um, mm -hmm. So I've, I've lined them up side by side because they're both looking at the same sort of story. And you, and we're seeing yep. somewhat, so so it seems like in the lymph nodes it's, it's expressing somewhat differently for the spleen, from the spleen, but I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, it, it's a decrease in both. I guess they don't have the significance bar, right? So yeah, so. that wasn't significantly different. But I mean, I don't know, like uh, more variability there. Yeah, I the, feel the like... signal's much clearer, right, in yeah. the spleen. Yeah, the mm -hmm. yeah, I think that, that that that's kind of right. That their immune system's complicated, and we only have a and this only is looking at like twelve patients. So we yeah. So uh, anyway, going. Like, from this, I guess, they end up focusing on the spleen after this, right? Yeah. Because the phenotype that they're seeing is, is just most pronounced there, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, like, yeah. Yeah. And the thing is, the spleen's a lot bigger, so there's a lot more, like, cells there for you to get some, mm -hmm. something out of it. Uh, I, mean, I know from, like, mouse studies, I was, like, dissecting out lymph nodes and, and spleens. The spleens tend to give out a much more, like, pronounced... Because they are much, a much bigger immune organ so I, i'm guessing mm -hmm. it might be similar for humans but i could be wrong because of course my all sorts of difference happened between mice and humans anyway uh jumping to yeah. figure s2 where looking at cxvr5 C cd4 cells which uh let me just look at my notes uh so i think that these are also follicular help cells but at a different stage of differentiation um mm -hmm. cxcr5 yeah cxcr5 uh, which is another mark because I guess cells transition through different phases and oh this is S two yeah so figure S two uh, I'm looking at S two A mm -hmm. so uh, again this uh, shows where CXCR five shows up in 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 the the structure of like germinal centers and you, mm -hmm. you can see that these sorts of cells don't appear very much <clears throat> on in the like COVID nineteen infected patients. So, yeah. and the actual images like kind of show quite clearly that the differentiation is 
very much very different uh, in each of them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the follicular helper cells in this case, uh, I, did we see the same thing with ICOS? Like, the, they also uh, replicate the structure of the germinal center. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, they sort of do, right? Like, in the ICOS ones, you, say, you see the same thing. Like, it's a specific spot of these germinal centers that these T follicular cells are hanging out in. <laughs> yeah, totally. Uh, and that kind of, again, this, like, has... Is another line of evidence to show what the role of t how the role of T follicular helper cells is being kind of p potentially interfered with during COVID nineteen in infection. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And yeah, I, I, again, you see it, the, the data isn't as as clean, but it, in like S two uh, C and D, you've got graphs uh, that show the distribution of uh, yeah things in the spleen, and yeah. It's... Yeah, I mean, another marker is good, right? Because, like, <laughs> uh, I think it also drives them down, like, a certain hypothesis. I guess there's probably different types of T follicular helper cells. So, like, this is also, like, part of their hypothesis building. Yeah. It's, CD, it's CXCR5. <laughs> um, CXCR5 ICOS positive yeah. uh, T follicular helper cells. It's defining the cells yeah. that we're talking about. And I'd like to think that sometime <laughs> in the future when someone's found these cells have a slightly different role, that they go back to this and go, oh, and then this will help them build up an explanation or something like that. So, Oh, absolutely. Yeah, like maybe there's a reason why the data doesn't look the same, right? Yeah. Like that the, this is like a less strong signal than the other, but like right now it can't be explained, or at least I didn't read the explanation for it in the text. Yeah, I... The, the, the text has a lot. Of, there's a, has to cover a lot, so the explanations are like often like less than a sentence. But mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and going back to the figure three, uh, this is going to be figure three B, which looks at BCL six. Mm -hmm. So moving mm -hmm. to like uh, BCL six uh, associated with T cells. So B, so again T follicular help cells with this marker and uh, seeing their distribution in the germinal centers, which is. Uh, Quite, again, it's you, you can see that there's a difference. Um, yeah, we've seen we've seen this before, right? This is the essentially the same thing as we saw in uh, two, right? Two B. Yeah, basically. <laughs> and except they like, they do zoom in and they show that the BCL six is inside the cells, and so you got like yes. these big white patches yes. inside the cells that. And then, then yes. the other. So, so again, it is T cells, right? Because yeah, CD four is our T cell marker yeah. here, and they didn't really tell us that before. Um, yeah, <clears throat> because before. The, yeah. So it's yeah, because yeah, yeah. I guess I guess it would have been nice at this point to for them to also show us the same type of with CD nineteen. <laughs> yeah. Right. So we could say what's happening with BCL six and B cells right now. Yeah. Um, but we're not going to get that because they're focusing on the story of the follicular helpers. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. Again, you get the, get a similar thing in, shown in the spleen, and again, you've got the attendant graphs. So BCL six in in F in the, in the spleen versus the, the lymph nodes. Uh, so <clears throat> yeah, uh, essentially, you get the, that same kind of story. Um, yeah, they they want to push us down this idea of. Uh, it's the it's the T follicular helper cells that have this BCL or yeah T follicular helper cells that have this BCL six, um, and the lack of them <laughs> in these in the infected uh, spleen and lymph nodes is maybe the cause of the the, the problem uh, in germinal center formation. Yeah. Uh, now jumping. I guess I guess oh, sorry. I was just gonna say it. I the re I, maybe the reason why they don't show us the B cells is because they show that the AID is ha happening the same. Yeah. So, <laughs> so like they they're saying maybe well, the, maybe the problems the T cells then in this in this scenario. Yeah, because it wasn't the follicular dendritic cells in the from the supplement. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, what else is there? Oh yeah. Okay. So going to figure S three A, they they talk a little about about this. Uh, idea about this is where they start introducing the idea of like fox p p3 and um so that's a marker for t regulatory cells so t regulatory cells are i guess like the internal affairs of the immune system where they tamp down the immune response and tell everyone to calm down and stop overreacting and so yeah for a long time i think they were called suppressor cells yeah. before they became t regulatory yeah <laughs> um 
So the idea they wanted to look at was whether there are any T follicular re regulatory cells. And the, well, the thing what they find is mm -hmm. that there are, there aren't very many uh, present. And uh, so I guess that this is where, where they start to bring it. So figure S3, so S3C, so... Yeah. Oh, yeah. So S3A, like, yeah, because I, I, this is this is a good one because they're also doubling down on the CXCR5, yeah. right? CD4 plus. Like, this is the T follicular helper subsection that they're looking at, um, and they're sort of ruling out, I guess, that they're not also this type of T reg. And, and like, I guess, maybe this is the important part about like talking about this immunology. It's like, technically, they should be ruling out every. Like, it's, it's what they know. Mm -hmm from what we know of the immune system, they have to rule out all the different possibilities. And we're sort of in the hands of the authors at this point, being non like experts in immunology. Cause like we only know where they tell us that they've ruled out the things, yeah. but someone who had that critical eye would say like, but did you rule out yeah. this, right? And I, I take confidence in the fact that this is a published article to know that at least, right? Like some peers have looked over this and this is good enough for this moment in history, yeah. right? <laughs> that like they've ruled out these these possibilities that could have been real possibilities. Yeah, for, <laughs> for, for definite. Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, and this, this paper does do the annoying thing of having figure S3B being only mentioned in like five figures time. So, so yes. I'm, so I'm <laughs> yeah. out to figure... Well, it, well, ignore that one now, yeah, and go for S3C, which C. focuses on TNF alpha <clears throat> expression. So, so TNF alpha is a big, important TH1 cytokine that is associated <laughs> with like quite a lot of like cell mediated uh, immunity, um, mm -hmm. pro-inflammatory, and it's supposed to be important to the, for the development of general centers. And they do mention that like uh, in mouse models that when there are certain models where general centers are lost and they can be restored by introducing TNF alpha again. So they're looking at <laughs> And they basically find that like TF, TNF alpha is expressed really greatly in the well in all of them basically. So there doesn't seem to be much uh, difference. I mean, actually, it seems to be quite a lot more in the uh, COVID nineteen yeah. patients. They, it's like an it's like an elevated amount of yeah. TNF alpha. Um, and you know, if you want to again use those crude ways of thinking about it, TNF alpha is a pro-inflammatory yes. cytokine. Right. And so we're seeing a pro inflammatory response. And I guess in certain circumstances, that response could disrupt the formation of germinal centers. Yeah. Right? That's the what was known from the mouse model. Yeah. So uh, that's kind of, yeah, I guess it's like almost like correlates with the, the disruption of germinal centers. Uh, so it could be causing mm -hmm. it. Um, I feel like that's what's. Yeah. Yeah. I guess we don't we don't know those causation things. We just. Well, yeah. I. I I mean again I guess if I was an immunologist I'd be a lot more certain about that but uh, since I don't know about this I'm just waiting for someone to come and say actually uh, um, but yeah. yeah they they look at the TNF alpha cells they they do it on a graph with and they again show that, that there's quite a big upregulation and stuff so it all mm -hmm. uh, it all kind of makes sense and then we go to uh, figure four A um, which shows which we talked about the TH1, TH2, TH17, and the T regulatory response. And so figure 4A mm -hmm. looks at whether th those are having impacts on this. So mm -hmm. so in C CD4, they look at TBET, which is a TH1 marker. Um, and uh, it looks like it's slightly upregulated uh, in, in, in this case. I mean, I can certainly... I cannot tell from looking at the... I, uh, yeah, I guess, yeah, I mean, in both early and late, it's a little bit more, yeah, little, <laughs> more teal yeah, dots. It's, it's quite hard to, to check because we are just looking at dots and I'm just trying to count the dots. And it's like, I see five yeah. dots on the non-COVID and then I see more than five dots on the others. Therefore, but they're giving us a sense of yeah. what their data looks like. And this is the same as what they were doing before, right? Like that CD4, they make little uh, halos around the yes. cells. So like the computer eye algorithm should be looking for the color of the molecule in question surrounded by the color that confirms that it's the type of cell that it yes. is. Uh, C, <laughs> uh, GATA3, that's indicated TH2. So this this is one that should be upregulated when there are germinal centers there. And so in non-COVID-19 uh, control spleens, it seems that that's, that's present a lot higher than the others. Now, mm -hmm. TH17 is the, the mystery one. And this is one where... I can't really see much difference be, be, between them. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And T-reg, uh, this is interesting because it seems to that T-reg is 
uh, there seems to be more presence in the late uh, late COVID nineteen patients and in the controls, but not in the early ones. Yeah. So, uh, but ultimately, like, let's show us the graphs yeah. and <laughs> you know, like I I feel like it's so interesting, like. There is like a lot of focus on like showing good representative images inside of like papers, but at the end of the day, like what does it matter the representative <laughs> image, <laughs> right? Because like if if they really did quantify it, then just show us the quantification. But I need that. Yeah. I don't know. Humans are very I'm visual, trying... right? We want to see the we want to see the confirmation. Yeah, no, you're right. The graphs. I'm gonna get that good thumbnails and get people clicking on this, going, "Look, there's shiny images." But yeah, you're absolutely right. I think that's the same reason. Well. When we chose the paper, we chose it because of the pictures, right? I was like, oh, it's great. We can look at these pictures. But, like, there's something – it's, like, it's like such a strange, like, fallacy where it's, like – but at the end of the day, the picture is only, like, they've cherry-picked that yeah. best picture to show you something that is ultimately borne out by the graph. And the graph is the thing that, like, we're going to interpret yeah, here. Yeah. Heart loves the pictures. Head loves the graphs. Heart loves the pictures. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Yeah. And, <clears throat> I mean, what we – and so it's bor it's borne out what you yeah, said, it's, right? Like, it's borne out most yeah. mostly. I mean, uh, yeah, actually it is. Uh, Tibet is uh, down, yeah. or sorry, Tibet is up in the infection. Yeah. Um, so that's TH one is up in the infection. Yeah, TH. Uh, Gata three looks down. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, uh, so that means TH two is down. Yeah. Uh, 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 gamma is. Uh, it's co mm -hmm. it's confusing uh, because it seems that that <laughs> it, it's down in total numbers, but as a proportion, it's up. So, yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's. I mean, it's very it's very weakly down in total numbers, yeah. right? There's no statistical significance between those. But, I mean, in... um, yeah. So it might be slightly elevated in the lymph yeah, nodes. It might be slightly elevated, <clears> and that <throat> would sort of make sense if it's right to mucosal response that it should kind of be upregulated. But again, I'm not. An expert in immunology, so I'm not. I don't know what they're doing in the. Because when I was learning mm -hmm. immunology, no one knew what TH17 cells existed, so I. <laughs> I wasn't taught it. I missed uh, the <laughs> And FOXP3, we're looking at. Uh, oh yeah. Well, it looks like it's down, <laughs> um, but actually in the proportions, it's, it's a wash. Yeah, it's. Yeah. So the clearest signal that comes out of this really is that TH1 response is yeah. up, right? Because the proportion of those is most clearly different. Yeah. Um, everything else is like, maybe if we had a bit more nuance to talk about it, we could. Um, I guess I'm confident in saying that there's sort of no difference in TZ TH17, right? I, I think ours look kind of enough the same that like they're the same i mean i'm mm -hmm. confident about nothing on this paper but um <laughs> but yeah i would be willing to say that that for this story the thing that's having the bigger impact is the th1 i'd say that that makes makes yeah. sense that well i mean that, that that's what they they go down yeah. that path right like you know we could gaze at this for a long time if it's not something in our immediate expertise like it's not helping us form hypotheses because we just don't yeah. know enough to form those hypotheses you... uh but the clear signal that they saw is the clear signal that they'll continue to investigate yeah, exactly right that and think they'll take that data and say well this is this is further confirmation right that uh in the absence of journal centers which would give us th2 response we're going to instead see th1 yeah and and this is in quite a small cohort of patients. So so actually the big the responses that we can only be sure of are the ones that are really big. So anything mm, more, yeah another good so, point. <clears throat> so it makes sense that that even if they see something slightly significant, it makes sense to chase the much bigger effect sizes just because those are more mm -hmm. likely to be consistent across across all the patients yep. and more generalizable. Abs um, absolutely, absolutely. So I think armed with this, they have come to their like rough hype right like they really come to the main hypothesis yeah. right of the paper right that um it's these bcl6 deficient t t follicular helper cells um and they they cause um th they ultimately cause this like dis dysregulation right of the journal center <laughs> formation um and consequently you get more of this homoral or you get more of this cellular immunity response you don't get as much homoral immunity yes um, and, and they're going to tie that. I mean, they tie that in the introduction as well to the idea that 
um, you see a drop off of humoral immunity, yeah. right? Um, in COVID nineteen patients, yeah. I, I think yeah. we have talked <clears throat> about that a little bit in our news sections. How there are papers coming out about the an the antibody response decreasing in patients after a certain time, and also like the problems that come yeah. with testing as well, where you're testing for antibodies and suddenly with this drop off means you can't necessarily be sure that people yes for ser serology testing yeah for ser right? yeah. So that... and it has implications from it has implications too about the the really cool reinfection experience yes. right the, the the cases that we saw um, in the news last week right that okay well if you're not getting a very high antibody response um, maybe that's why that you can get another strain to enter your cells and and repeat this process yeah and I think that... maybe the disease isn't going to be as bad right like, it could be that disease isn't as bad we don't know still right yeah. like I don't think those two papers told us anything but you can still pick up replicate the virus and send it back out into the population yeah um, I mean I yeah. think that the, like that's oh, part of the reason why I think we chose this paper because then this was also talk this eventually we'll talk about m immune memory and I, and I think that this says lots of interesting things yeah um, yeah yeah so let's let's move on to the next so figure uh, it jumps to figure s5 or s mm. s4 uh, yeah s4 sorry s4 uh, where I mean s4 looks at uh, cd4 cells and cytotoxic T cells and they basically say that there's uh, not many uh, cd4 cells in like the early kind of patients compared to like the mm -hmm. the late patients where there seems to be quite a lot compared to the cytotoxic T cells um, mm -hmm. and in uh, the control you so, kind of see oh, yeah. quite a, a fair so actually yeah that's odd because the late response there are very little cytotoxic T cells compared to like the control which mm -hmm. is kind of yeah that's not not what you'd want for a, yeah. a fighting a virus. In the, in in the image in the image yes of course in the image that's always has to be on top of our minds because you yeah you get to choose what the images you put on your papers um <laughs> yeah and similar sort of patterns are seen with uh, the spleens uh in and but of course we want to look at the the graphs so the actual the, the cold hard graphs say that yeah the actually yeah they can't really draw significance from them. Yeah, they can't draw significance. They're really, yeah, just looking at them like, huh? yeah, no, I mean, they, they have, yeah, they, they, there's not really that much difference. I've, um, but, but maybe in the late lymph nodes, there's more CD, like what you were saying, right? <laughs> it's like a very slight thing. So like, there's the thing. basically the idea. Yeah, the suggestion is it supports the TH1 response, yes. right? <laughs> Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Because, well, I, I mean, it, I mean, that's what I wrote down because I guess that's what it said in the text. But like, wouldn't we see? We would want to see more CD8 relative to, um, relative to CD4 I... in a TH1 response, yeah. right? Because like that means more signaling through the cellular immunity pathway. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I, I mean, I, I guess so. I mean, yeah, because. Again, not having that background of what an, a normal immune response should look yeah, like. Yeah, yeah. Because mm -hmm. I can imagine, mm -hmm. I understand like why we'd want those CD8 T cells, but I also understand why you wouldn't want too many T CD8 T cells. So, right, because, right. So uh, it does speak to the idea that this is a tightly regulated process, and that regulation, something's going wrong with that regulation. Yes, yes. <clears throat> uh, so the next one is figure S5. We're looking at uh, T and B cell conjugates. So this is looking at... Um, uh, like why why the like kind of mature T B cells are appearing and looking at that kind of T and B cell interaction, so mm -hmm. they have this fancy software that that looks that manages to get images like look at all the cells and then look at the points where they're interacting by an area of like microns and seeing like whether mm -hmm. using that overlap to count how many like T cell kind of interactions there are with B cells. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like, right in the germinal center, this would be happening, right? Like that's, that's what happens in germinal centers. Yes. <laughs> T cells and driving the B cells, the B cells cycle through, like it's all done in this sort of dense node, yeah. right? And that, that creates the, the tissue structure. But because they saw that AID wasn't different, right? They're going down this path. Well, it must have, something has to be telling the cells to go and, and, and start to somatically hypermutate. Yeah. Um, so yeah. <laughs> And yeah, that, that's what they show in uh, the lymph nodes and in the spleen. Uh, or does that? Yep. yep. 
uh just the lymph nodes in this at least yeah all right these are just lymph node pictures oh yeah but i think in do they quantify that later i guess they never do they, yeah they don't really <laughs> uh quantify it um <clears throat> they do just show lots of fancy pictures of of t cells interacting with b cells and and there's like it's very much a methodology yes. you know like this is like very much like oh here's their capabilities of doing things yeah um and i guess like the actual level of evidence might not be that because all you have to prove is that the, this is happening you don't necessarily need to get numbers yes i mean the idea that one sure, interaction absolutely. might be enough to show oh it's happening um so yeah the yeah, because it's not like every AID positive cell has to be attached to one of these interactions, yeah. right? Like, it's just saying, like, these interactions do happen. Yeah. <laughs> and therefore, that could explain why these AID cell, positive cells are appearing. And I've got, like, yes. a bunch of, like, p p images that don't look very good on the stream at all because they, they need to be looked in a high def. So if you want to see, like, because they show, like, white pictures of, like, white cells, but with, like, a little border around them that that has like the marker for mm -hmm. the CD8 and the um, the uh, CD19. So it's not like yeah, not the best image. To... Yeah, <laughs> a right like you. They really want to focus on this like yeah that overlap section. Technically, there's like yellow pixels there that they're probably counting. Yes, there there are some yellow pixels there that. They're not very much of them, but then again, they're, they're not very. You don't need to have very many there because there aren't very many mm -hmm. AID uh, positive cells. But the, the the point is, the computer took care yeah, of it, <laughs> and like and like in these examples, like this is what the computer said was overlap. So if you believe, right, if you see this and you're like, I believe that, then trust that the computer found yes. these. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and which is get more better than like I guess it's more reassuring than saying a human found it because the humans. We can kind of find yeah. patterns in all sorts of things. A, co a computer that's like absolutely told to, like we have a specific algorithm rules we can just dictate the exact logic and it's used in the same way throughout all the parts of the image. Uh, then we can yeah yeah these co-localization things. It's like I I think Image J has a great like set of plugins right that do, do this. And for all we know, it's the same backend right algorithmic stuff uh, going on in this piece of software. Yeah. Uh, so then that brings us to. The uh, S5. Oh, we've got S5C, which is uh, again looking at um, double negative. So, well, now they're looking at a different type of yeah. cell. See, they're looking at some B cells here, yeah. right? Uh, me memory B cells, Cla class unswitched memory B cells. Yes. Is that what it is? So, <laughs> because IgD. Because like, at the end of the day, you want cells to go to make IgG. Yes. That's like the big um, immune molecule. But like they may make a bunch of different things before then. <laughs> uh, CD27, that's yeah. memory. <clears throat> uh, yeah, so they've been looking at the development of memory. and um... So the cells that have this interaction is what they're saying, yeah. right? Or, oh, no, they just, they just are. Yeah. <laughs> These, some of these CD19 cells are also becoming memory Which, cells. Which, again, it's not something you'd necessarily expect if, like, the journal center isn't happening. Because mm -hmm. these are, so B cells are yeah. sort of finding, life finds a way. B cells are finding a way to mature, even without the journal center. Yeah, like, why aren't they going through, like, from knowing how the ger journal center works, why don't they go through apoptosis? Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're not seeing, I, I think a question is, what is the interaction between these developing B cells and the follicular mm -hmm. dendritic cells? Because like that interaction is important to prevent them from going through apoptosis. Something else is happening in this yeah. case. Um, yeah. So is it just the body? That, and also the, I find that this paper is a lot of the how. It's really trying to describe us the how of these things, but the why is still missing, yeah. right? Like, why is it? Is this normal body processes just going as normal? Or is there something about the virus that's being made that's that's driving it down this path? <clears throat> yeah. Uh, but it's only the, this paper is just a setup to that. It's not even trying yeah, to ask that at all, right? Like, <laughs> it's it's really just describing this really interesting um, uh, sort of phenomena that's occurring um, in the absence of germinal centers. Yeah. And tying that to a lack of follicular or T follicular helper cells, BCL6 expressing TCL. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so now we actually get to talk about Figure S3, which is finally mentioned uh, in relation to BCL6 and IgG. Um, 
where again he's they, they try and measure like I guess matured like uh, so matured cells so plasma blasts that's what they're looking mm -hmm. at sorry yeah so yeah the... yeah so here's the IGT right these are the matured ones they're they're presumably in production mode yeah. so these are the ones that are production mode they sh maybe they shouldn't be there if they're without the germinal centers again like the, they're like the sister cells to the memory cells where they do stuff and uh, they're they, again, they're present in... But they are there. Yeah, they're <laughs> present. That's the thing. They're suggesting yeah. that there's... They're present and not inside of the germinal centers. They've been distributed yeah. everywhere. Which is, again, they're, they're trying to throw a lot of sort of like weak things like this happens, this happens, as a way of as a way of explaining that AID and like the fact that it's still... Presumably it's still going. And, and really, I think that this is all tied into that discussion of like, so the immune response that we see in severe... COVID-19 infected patients, right? Yeah. Is that the right immune response? Are those antibodies the right antibodies? Because they're being made in a circumstance, right, that is kind of outside of everything, yeah. outside of what would normally happen. <clears throat> yeah, uh, that brings us back. So once again, if, if you have those antibody titers, I, you know, I just, I feel like I want to harp on that yeah. a lot because the reinfection paper said that too. Like, if you have those antibodies, well, we have no idea what that means for how you're set, how how you might re get reinfected and then spread that to other people. Yeah. Right. Even we don't even know if it's gonna help you with the next time you get infected. Yeah. Because like uh, they might not last long, and they were made under very strange circumstances. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, so yeah. Um. So I guess at this point they they move away from the autopsy patients. They start looking in in uh, real life patients who. I say real life. Um, mm -hmm. uh, patients who <laughs> were admitted to hospital who uh, were either convalescent or had uh, s various stages of like moderate or, or severe diseases. Um, yeah. Well, they want to expand, right? They kind of want to take this hypothesis and they want to run yeah. with it, right? If they're saying that um, germinal centers are affected in COVID nineteen patients, right, and that re that results in like some weird stuff happening with your B cells, like you're still making them, but like they're not really being made correctly and maybe they they yeah, anyways. So, yeah. Let's let let's widen the search now to to some more people. Yeah, I mean now we're gonna be moving away from general centers looking at the results of those. So uh, what yeah. kind of uh, defect so kind of you're gonna look see whether there's any interesting odd things happening on the B cells and whether we can link that back to what we found out about the general centers. That mm -hmm. um so yeah, they separate um, into like four groups where like they've got like uh, the convalescent group. So this is a figure, so a table S4. So they take PVMC mm -hmm. samples. So these are blood samples and looking at the cells inside them. And so this is showing a big table of like how they kind of parcel up different patients. So the interesting thing I find mm -hmm. here is like where they, they have what would usually be three groups. So convalescent people who recover from the disease, moderate people who haven't shown many symptoms but tested positive, and severe, but they split up the severe by the amount of C-reactive protein they find in in the blood. I think so. Mm -hmm. So that's like kind of yeah, that's an inflammation inflammation yeah. marker. Um, so and that's going to be playing a a big role in how they interpret their their results. Uh, Maybe even like a sep a sepsis yeah. marker, right? It's also sort of saying like there's stuff in the blood. So C-reactive protein is uh is co complement. It's so, part yeah. of complement, I think. Uh, I. Yeah, and so it means that there's something in the blood that's elevating it. I think it might also be made in the liver. Um, more of it means there's bad stuff in the blood. Yeah. It's, it, yeah. And uh, so, and figure S6 is where I'm starting, because that is the, how, showing the complexities of... Fi the gating yeah, strategy. The gating strategy. It's, also like, it's a good way to figure out the complexities yeah. of all the different cell types that they're looking at, because uh, there are quite a lot. Um, mm-hmm. It's quite, I mean, I, I like it because, well, first of all, we talked about gating strategies as like, this is how they're splitting up yeah. the cells, right, to tell us which types are which. But I love the flow chart yes. nature of this because that, that has actually, that maps onto the whole development thought yeah. of everything, right? That like all these cells come from each other in some way, right? And through research, people have determined that like the way that you know that the cell has changed is that it expresses something high or low. Yeah. <laughs> and so like with this whole little flow chart, right? Like they're saying, you know, that you read the axes as like upwards is more, yeah. right? Rightwards is more. And so like more CD19, right? 
that gives you all the B cells. Um, what's next? Oh, less CD thirty eight. Yep. <laughs> right. CD twenty seven positive. That gives you um, plasma cells. The plasma, plasma plasma blasts. Plasma cells. Uh, so things. That, mm -hmm. And then then they separate the plasma blasts uh, from these mature cells using CD one three eight. Um, then they, <clears throat> they take CD3 negative cells and separate those out into multiple cell types. And uh, you, so you've got like marginal, uh, so you've got transitional B cells uh, and marginal B cell precursors, which themselves split up into follicular B cells and late stage transitioning B cells. <laughs> um, so they're basically showing you how they're thinking about things as well. This is how they're separating out cells. So you can trace back kind of each step of the way, um, mm -hmm. which, is, which is very. Uh, very useful because because all these all these steps would be happening in a germinal center right like yeah. in a germinal center they're all happening and they are leading from a cell moving from naive into a mature plasma yes. blast <clears throat> exactly um so and you also and it also shows you the significance of cell markers and how the context of them also matters sometimes because sometimes you, they show things mm -hmm. they use some things but then it it just splits in different ways uh so you've got like uh, CD1 and C, which shows up some variation of activation. So uh, you've got like uh, IGD CD27s, uh, they're the memory cells. So you've got switched memory cells, which are CD27 plus. Um, and then they've got this uh, really- and, and that's a, that's a, sorry, that's a big part of their hypothesis, yes. right? Is that they, they, they think that because there's no germinal, <laughs> germinal centers, right? The B cells that are maturing are maturing through a different route yeah maybe this route this switched memory route <laughs> yeah um where they just instead of instead of i guess going through all those selection things and then maturing they instead like they got recognized and now they're being forced to be become go into production mode without having been selected already through multiple rounds yeah <clears throat> and the interesting cell type that i think they're going to focus on a fair bit is the igd negative cd27 negative cells that have been through all those and which I look back in literature, they're, they're, they've been called various things. I think uh, um, one of the people called them exhausted memory cells, which is my favorite one. Mm. Is, uh, that, paints a, <laughs> that paints a picture, not necessarily an accurate picture of what's going on, but uh, a picture that was very <laughs> memorable of just <laughs> tired. Yeah, because <laughs> the little like mushroom cloud puff. <laughs> yeah. The, <laughs> Because the idea, like that's been put through in the literature, these these kind of cells are produced by like cr ch chronic inflammation, like the an excessive T Th1 response, mm -hmm. and then they have these cells that we're not mm -hmm. sure exactly what they're doing, but they're kind of a sign of something bad happening, and so so I guess the thing we're calling them is exhausted uh, memory B cells is my uh, that's that's the one that kind of most vividly yeah. gives me an image, even though I imagine like in five years when the people figure out what they're meant actually doing, they're going to call them something completely different. Um, uh, yeah. But for this paper, we're going to be calling them uh, double negative cells. Uh, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so that brings us to figure 5A, well, no, figure X6, sorry. Figure X6 also looks at, uh, look, basically looks at kind of, gives us a preview of the kind of plots we'll be looking at in the future and what kind of areas will be recognized as certain cell types. So this is a gating strategy of where they're kind of setting things out in advance so that you know that they, they're trying to be fair. Because otherwise, you can draw these circles yeah. any way you want. Well, we, yeah, we, we we saw the we saw the gating strategy, yes. and then this is they're just now like they just extracted yeah. it right and like put the labels on so like that we know for sure. Yeah, the information's all there up in in yeah. A, right? Like they're all extracted from there, but now they're giving us like the names. It's better labeled. Yeah. So <laughs> again, this is like going to be so if you're reading the paper, this is going to be the uh, key, the atlas that you're going to be referring back to to. To double check things yes yeah yeah and and as with most things like in the paper they they just throw it out and they say like this was all figured out before by this yeah. paper, right they cite they cite where they're getting this information from because again this is a very specific like hypothesis in the time this is very basic research right like everyone just knows this much about the cells so far so good enough right if those definitions are right then these definitions are right then we get a hypothesis that like right that we can we can yeah. talk about um so figure five, they they have the they look at convalescent, severe, and uh, severe CRP in in looking at naive B cells, yeah. uh, T1 slash stratified. Yeah. 
So uh, T1 slash 2 B cells, which are transitioning B cells from uh, the stage called T1. So again, we're throwing out a lot of words. So um, best. So I'm basically <laughs> going to describe these as transitioning B cells rather than because otherwise Th1, Th2, that can be quite confusing. So these B cells are kind of yeah. developing from naive and they're becoming mature. They're, this is a teenage years. And then you got uh, follicular mm -hmm. B cells, which are, <laughs> I think kind of uh, towards the end stage of of their differentiation. And and yeah, sure. so boiling that down into I like into that graphs, uh, um, you've got um, so uh, so uh, da, da, da. so uh, yeah, it looks like there's something happening. I mean, I I keep seeing see, see a lot of significance bars, but I'm not sure exactly. So by by looks of it, some things are decreasing the more severe the disease are getting. So uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> so that's the transitioning B cells seem to be decreasing. So, so same with the follicular cells, and I, I'm guessing as well mm -hmm. with the uh, naive B cells. Uh, <clears throat> I need to make my graphs bigger so I, I can read them. Um, yes. Same with the naive B yes. cells. Um, <clears throat> but more so in the most severe, <laughs> least so in the least yes. severe. But they're going to help us with that too, right? They're going to give us correlations. Yeah, they're going now. to give us correlations. <laughs> in the next... but, I mean, I think it's yeah. quite helpful to look at this in segmented, like kind of as columns, because correlation it, it gets a bit bit messy when you start doing correlations. Uh, That's true. Just mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> just because like just the way that correlations work and what you're comparing them to are this... So we'll get we'll talk about that more when we get to it. Um, yeah. If we get S seven is another one that we're going to be jumping to. That's another graph looking at. Uh, Oh, let's see, what does it say? Uh, absolute lymphocyte count. So that doesn't change. So ALC is absolute lymphocyte count. That doesn't change. Uh, then you've got your mm -hmm. CD19 B cells. That decreases. Um, mm -hmm. figures so it's reconnected now. Uh, oh, great. <laughs> yeah. So uh, let's see. Okay. Um, the last thing that I heard was we were just talking about we're going through S7. Yep. You're saying ALC hasn't changed. Uh, B cells are slightly decreased, and um, it basically reshows the same data that we saw in uh, Figure Five uh, B. So yes, um, plasma blasts haven't changed. Yep. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, There's none of these like good activated cells. Oh, yeah. We just don't see any of those, right? Because CD21 activated naive B cells. That's all zero. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, um, so I... These cell types are not present, or they're only... The, the, some of the most severe cases have them. <laughs> yeah. These strange intermediates. Yeah. Um, okay. and so uh, I guess moving... Yeah, and that's... And then D, it's, like, clear in the ratios, right? That, like, the most severe patients have, like, a subset of cells that really don't appear anywhere yeah. else. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> I'm, I guess we, we're we going to get... Because, again, this, the way this paper is segmented, they talk about S7, like, A and B, and then they... Oh, yeah, sorry, they, they jump over, yeah. So yeah. It's sorry, a, <laughs> apologies. A, so I guess, like, going to figure 5C, where they do the correlations, where they look at... Uh, they look at... The CRP so they basically um, compare it to um, CRP, and yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, they yeah, because like they they binned CRP yeah. at first, right, to give us like to, so we can see severe versus uh, severe not severe in two different severity levels, but um, you know the, you don't have to bin it; they can also just show us the direct correlation, yeah. uh, which is what they do. <laughs> and uh, correlation graphs are quite difficult because especially when there's so many things happening. Um, but it, it does seem like there is something there. Um, I mean, yeah. especially in the, uh, the, the, yeah, some of those, but yeah, it's always quite difficult because you're not dealing, but, but that, but that supports seeing the difference between severe intermediate and severe yeah. high, right? That supports that kind of binning. I mean, I am kind of uncomfortable with like binning on the same thing that you're doing correlation on, but. That's a, I guess that might be a quirk of the way the paper is structured and how it tells its story rather than the way the data is actually analyzed. Um, sure. Wait, so why don't you oh, want to bin on the thing so that you So basically if I'm with? taking a group and like separating it, like isolating it based on like a certain kind of factor and then using that same factor mm -hmm. as an output, 
it seems like almost like I'm manipulating the data in my favor by doing that. That's the oh yeah oh but but, the, but these aren't yeah, bins. That's right. The correlation that they do is that's with everything, yeah. right? So it's unbinned yeah. now and they so do it. That's, but yeah, that's why it's it's okay. So, it's just, that's why it kind of it instantly set off like an alarm in my head that that mm -hmm. was uh, yeah. But I agree with you. If they if they binned and then they did correlations on those yeah. bins, then right? It, then okay. But they did. But it but that that also matters. That would matter. Like what did they bin with? Yeah. Right. Sort of like in how it flows into the story, I guess. <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, you're right. This this doesn't have too much of an effect on this. Um, and Figure Five D also looks at uh, total hospitalization and symptom uh, duration, which are again okay. like because they they are technically I guess just as related to CRP, but I guess it does illustrate that there are like other things that. So I mean, this isn't the kind of correlation where you'd like go back and go look at the like number of T-transitioning T-cells and suddenly go, oh, now that your patient's going to going to die. I mean, it's not like that kind of, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, it, not, like it's not It's not useful. This stuff isn't going to be useful for the yeah. clinic. It's more, again, supporting the idea that in severe cases, like the this, it's trying to support the idea that this weird defect in, in ger germinal centers leading to the defect in B-cells is also showing us the severity of yeah. disease. Right, I mean that's that's a big question. Why do some people get sick and some people don't? Um, on the immune side, like this is the description. Yeah, and from that respect, it actually like shows the, the practical applications of this idea and what how how <laughs> how much it can explain about the situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Practical in the explanatory it's, sense, not in the, the what we're yeah, doing in the sorry, that's in the clinic yeah, sense. Yeah, this is like <laughs> I guess what we call like one of the money makers of the of the paper, the bit where clinicians always. People, for sure we, yeah yeah because yeah, it draws it all full circle um uh, yeah for people who are thinking about disease yeah, yeah definitely <laughs> uh and then we're going to 6a where we were kind of in the end game looking at uh switched memory b cells uh and activated memory b cells in and yeah we're seeing like they see more of those weird switches, those switch memory yeah, bees. Yeah, switch memory <clears throat> bees. Uh, in like the severe uh, case, case patients, and yeah, that's yeah. Again, like this is part of that messed up, right? Like th this is their their hypothesis. Like it messes up the B cells. Like yeah, you still make antibodies, right? We're not saying that when you get infected, you don't make antibodies, but they're not going through the same um, rounds of selection uh, as as they would normally. Yeah. So like, I, I, I hope we were clear at the beginning that in the germinal center, like it's not just like a single path that goes mm -hmm. through, right? Like once, once a cell, um, once a, a B cell recognizes it, it, it gets mutated. That's the somatic hypermutation still happening in this model. But then some of those cells go back and they get selected again, right? And then they somatically hypermutate again and they keep going through that cycle. And the idea is that like, or I mean, at some point they stop, right? But the idea is that after going through that cycle, they're going to have good antibodies, yeah. right? For 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 this um, for this antigen, and this the type of information that they're trying to present us here is saying maybe that's not the case. Yeah. <laughs> that maybe what we're getting is like it's not happening in germinal centers. So that, yeah, you're getting tons of antibodies, but they haven't gone through that process of like finding the best one, and so you get like a big splash of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and and uh, it's supposed to give us hope about, um, well, I guess we haven't even gotten to seven yet, but like it's supposed to give us hope about uh, a vaccine, yeah. right? That like vaccines don't go through the process. <laughs> this Like it's artif they artificially induce yeah. this process. Um, but it also might say that like, what about live vaccines? Yeah. So, I mean, not that we have any or like an inactivated vaccine. Maybe that's not like... That's not going to work in the same way because um, if it's relying on the same uh, adjuvant sort of molecules that are just like inherent on the virus itself, it won't direct down the right path. Yeah. I feel like that might be something. I think that that's said. that's definitely something. Yeah, because trying to it... we want to we want an artificially induced. We want to control that vaccine yeah. process to make sure we're making the antibodies that we want. Because if we don't control it. <laughs> um, that well like it's not yeah we can... people who are infected have a different type of immunity because yeah. you don't want the, the kind of immunity seen in in uh this kind of figure you don't want like the severe immunity where things are, mm -hmm. 
the, you want to yeah. have the nice general center. So this is something that, again, when you're testing vaccines, it's something for you to look out for people to look out for to to see if there is uh, mm-hmm. the immune response is working because you want people to to yeah. recover from a vaccine the same way a convalescent patient would recover with like that kind of immune response that's ready that a healthy immune response. Um, right. Right. I guess that that's interesting. That, that's a good point that the convalescent people, they aren't seeing as much of a right. Th- this weird phenotype come out. Yeah. So some people do go down the path where they mount a successful, which then just gives you the why question. Why in some people, but not others. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where it brings us back to it. Right. We haven't resolved yeah. it. Like we're we're getting at the how we're trying to get at the why but we're still not there yet because like the mechanism isn't known. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and I guess we're going to go to uh, okay. I'm going to jump into six deep because it's looking at the same, basically looking at the same plot, but focusing on the d- those double negative cells, the mm-hmm. those cells which are, which are exhausted memory cells. Which again we see a, a big like increase in the se- severe CRP infected uh, uh, patients. Yep. Um, yep. And then jumping back again to the uh, plasma blasts. Um, yeah, and actually like. Plasma blasts, we do see that there is an increase in the severe CRP. So they are producing plasma blasts that are mm-hmm. like mounting, I guess, some kind of antibody response. Um, so, uh, but the, the, of yeah. course, but like, but what are those antibodies, yeah. right? Like, if they haven't been selected through that process, yeah. Mm-hmm. And there is uh, this issue with like this inflammatory like sickness that people get when in COVID. That second. Like where the immune system is going, running riot and doing lots of other stuff that you don't want it to do. Mm-hmm. That is the thing that is the mm-hmm. severe part of the infection. So uh, that might be an interesting thing avenue to look at. Um, and in terms of the last one, which is which I'm talking about, which is Figure Six C, which is activated naive and tra- late stage transition cells, uh, which I guess is another symptom of non general center related activation. Um, I mean, that's even yeah. weirder, right? If they're naive, it means they haven't seen the antigen. Yeah. Like, then they're just making random antibodies. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that, that orange, <laughs> just, they're just spouting stuff off, which you can understand why that would yeah. be a bad thing for the immune system, because you... And I guess the other thing, I think, like, the hope is, the germinal center is also supposed to help um, sort of govern all this competition, right? That, like, only the best thing is going to end up being the most prominent cell type out there but if if there's no if there's no competition like that and we're just getting all these different things getting activated you also just have less <laughs> of the right antibody so yeah. even if in that mix you have the right antibody or the right mix of antibodies it's being diluted out <laughs> and you can only make so many things <laughs> against your body exactly <clears throat> um and i guess like go, now jumping back to figure s7 uh, c which again like focuses on those like defect so uh, get, it, the thing, the important thing to, I think that Figure S7C points out is that a lot of these differences are actually quite small when counting real-term cells, but mm-hmm. uh, but as a proportion of the total cell cell res, those cell response, they're different. So that's quite interesting because if you were just like counting the number of B cells from a patient, they might look the mm-hmm. same for, for for the severe and the they might look very similar, but the actual proportion of these different subtypes is what de- defines the the difference. Yeah, I, I like that they show that it's happening in the severe cases. Yes. Um, it does draw attention to, again, that factor. Like, what is the factor that makes severe disease happen? Yeah. Right? And and I think what's good about this basic research exercise is that it's giving us more tools that we can ask around the question. Yeah. Right? Because, like, someone can dive in and say, okay, well, maybe this is because – maybe the reason that – uh, the activated naive B cells are up is because of this reason. So then they can investigate in the next iteration of right papers. What makes severe people go down that path? <laughs> yeah, com- yeah, completely. Um, yeah, and I guess that we can go back to Sevilla six E, which is which brings us to like. So it kind of like has some nice fancy graphics to show kind of the composition of the uh, immune response. As well yeah. as looking at like, um, I mean, this is the most illustrative. Yeah. You know, if you're looking for a summary yeah. <laughs> of what we saw from A to D, and then what we saw there, right? Like, here are the little bar graphs that show us that, like, right, that control in the convalescence. Okay, that's like that's the composition of cells you'd expect to see. 
but in these severe diseases it's like it's messed up in some way yeah there's some something jacked up is happening with those yeah these other subtypes that aren't usually present yeah and again uh figure six f we've got correlating uh the uh crp level with um activated b cells uh, mm -hmm. Again, looking at the total B cell response and relating that to, the, and they do find some correlation, but mm -hmm. yeah, that more B cells equals relatively more damage. But um, again, the the co composition. I mean, we know, in some ways it's less, it's just full circle, right? Like yeah. we would expect this from what we saw in C because yeah. these are the same pa these are the same patients. Yeah, right? this is, these are the same patients. Exactly. So <laughs> again, this. <laughs> Yeah, you're you're right. You're right. So it's not necessarily telling us much more than we, what we've already seen, but it's at least on five C. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that brings us to Figure Seven A, which I guess. Oh yeah. Which, Sorry, I was just gonna say. I guess it confirms again their binning in yeah. A to D that those are different. Okay. <clears throat> uh, yeah. So now we're going into the thing that we're all very interested in: is are these B cells attacking COVID? Like, do mm -hmm. they find to? So they look at the receptor binding domain for for COVID. So they produce a version of the receptor binding domain that is fluorescent that they can add to these cells to see whether they they bind or not. Um, mm -hmm. So figure seven a they they show like that there are COVID binding B cells, um, and uh, in, in convalescence and severe and the severe ones have much less uh, COVID nineteen binding uh, B cells, which is, yes yeah um and uh they do show like the the gating strategy for the covid uh cells so uh they mm -hmm. look at like so we they revisit quite a lot of the same cell types that we've seen before so um they're looking at uh the appearance of those like jacked up b cells so in convalescent serum you can see actually the each the the activated uh covid19 uh ones they all map to specific populations of cells yeah. you can see that so the the, the the red dots are the positives yes. for the rbd and then this gating strategy is just the same one it's the same sample right that went through to produce the graph right in yeah earlier presumably but like they're they can do all i mean this is like such such fancy machines because like they can then show us <laughs> how do those dots map out with all that other stuff that we've been talking about yeah um so the convalescence, yep. it's like how the immune system... They're not switched memory. Yeah. <laughs> switched memory does not contain the subset. <laughs> oh, yeah. The, so <clears> the <throat> severe cases, you see much less fewer of those dots. And the dots actually don't seem to map to any specific population. They yep. seem to be Which very, is consistent. Yeah. They're not being selected properly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So they aren't being selected or expanded. There are still some there, but they're not kind of being promoted in the same way. Which, mm -hmm. which is consistent. And I... And uh, I think that brings us quite neatly to uh, Figure Seven uh, B, where they show lots of pie charts. They've got some delicious pie, um, <laughs> where they compare convalescents. So they they have like many more. They've got ten convalescent patients, and they compare to like four severe patients, and and some mm -hmm. of them. So I mean, one of the severe patients has over half of their B cells this um, D double negative type, which. Uh, which I guess could potentially skew the data a little bit, but it's, mm -hmm. but the fact that you are seeing these like radical differences is interesting in itself, and and I guess it does like yeah. point to those like edge cases happening where there are sometimes where people might have a, and even in rare cases people might not get any memory back or so it's yeah so in B they're showing us um, for at states of convalescence yes states. What does that mean? It's over time. <laughs> so, let's see. Oh. So, uh, da, da, da. oh, it's just it's just they looked at more than it's the same as A. They just looked at more people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, they looked at. Yeah. But they pooled, they pooled several samples of them. Yeah. Right. Each. Each one is like a pool of. Oh no! I think those those are so. To the left, they have the individual patients, and to the right, they have these two big pools of all of those patients. Yeah. No, but I'm saying there's a total underneath each of the pie charts. That's how many samples they took from the person. I guess. I guess so. So I mean, you. I guess you'd want. Uh, 
Yeah, I, I'm, I'm guessing so because uh, obviously, like yeah. they, they might might differ. So, um, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, even on like, even on the paper version, I've got like so total of like fourteen, I guess, underneath the the poor person who's like half pink on his, <laughs> on there. So yeah. I, uh, I was accidentally gendering someone who I have no idea, but. Uh, <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, all the activated and mainly disease-related populations contain cells. Hmm. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, well. And hmm. uh, the, the last bit is actually, uh, yeah. So, I mean, B is like, they've got like almost three graphs in, in there, there. And the last one, I think it does pull a lot of, so they, they look at, um, they they pull the severe and the convalescence, and they do di direct comparisons of the expression of like these certain cells, and mm -hmm. they do... the numbers. It's just yeah. the, it's the percentage, right? Yeah. The cells. It's the same. It's 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 what we saw in A. They're just giving it in bar form now. Yeah. So they can show some significance in in the DN one mm -hmm. uh, category, where. Mm -hmm. But again, the the sample of patients is it's not very big, so it's, the, the chance of actually finding significance wasn't very high in the first place but this mm -hmm. is so i think we, we can so that's like the last figure on this paper and i think it, it does paint like a fairly interesting story oh yeah yeah T totally I, I mean so it doesn't say why i mean it says why but like in this sort of mechanistic immunological mm. way but like you know the immunology we can ask why down like a a rabbit hole <laughs> right of all those whys it would be nice to know yeah it would be nice to know if it's like is this i mean from the host pathogen interaction standpoint right is it something about the way that the virus impacts these hosts that causes this defect because it's only happening in the severe cases yeah. right <clears throat> and yeah uh huh but in the early, oh, right, and early is basically a proxy. I'm just thinking of how this links back to the lymph nodes mm. and stuff. Because early, they recovered early, right? And late, they, or early, they died yeah, early. they died early. So well, theoretically, those would be the more severe d diseases. Those are the severe, right. And late is they died later, so that's like the less severe. And I guess you can sort of gaze out in some of the stuff in B, in figure 4B, Right where it's like there was that uncertainty about what was up and down versus uh, late versus early. Oh no, they only do lymph nodes and spleen there. They don't do late versus early. Oh no, in every graph, late versus early is done with red dots versus like pink or weird mauve dots. Yeah. Um, um, and there's never really a big pattern. Yeah. They... <laughs> But their sample size is so much smaller based on how much blood they got. Yeah. Right. Blood samples they had a lot more blood samples. Yeah. So yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, this like there are like almost two separate papers in here that are, that have some links. There's one where they're looking at the the autopsies and one where they're looking at the blood, and they do link it based on like the differentiation of the B cells that kind of does build up there. Yeah. On. Yeah, well, I, I mean, if we're to believe the sequence of the data that they present and that they found one versus the other, right? Yeah. If that they did this study in lymph nodes and that gave them the indication that something could be happening, yeah. right? So they wanted to confirm in a greater population by going to blood. Um, and in blood, you can't get the same, you, you don't get the same resolution, right? You don't know if their germinal centers are messed yeah. up, but like that's what we got from the lymph Yeah, it's, all we yeah. get is like these jacked up B cells that they keep finding in in the blood, which uh, does indicate that there can mm -hmm. be some. That, so th I think it does build up that idea that there is something happening with the uh, memory cells, and that that mm -hmm. the, and also that there is a diversity in the immune reactions in in people. That means that I mean it does yeah. like speak to that story of like the the, the occasional decrease in antibody production. And also the potential for reinfection, because as we're seeing, there is an issue with the creation of uh, memory cells in severe cases. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I want to know, I, again, like if we could keep driving down and asking the question, why do severe patients mm. die? Yeah. <laughs> or like, right, like what, what, why do some patients become severe and some patients mm -hmm. don't? Um, that is like so important to know with the vaccine, yes. because 
then we can evaluate the vaccines to make sure that they don't um, they don't end up using a mechanism, right? Or they're not designed to use a mechanism that you know is basically bypassed by the people with severe disease, right? Like I would like the vaccine to prevent severe disease, right? Like or that's that's one of the ways the vaccine yeah. could be very useful to us is to prevent severe disease. Um, and this is giving us some information so we can verify that. And I think um, from the on the mechanistic side and going from the mechanistic side again, I think I understand because this coronavirus isn't the only like virus that actually causes this effect. This effect is seen in people with HIV. It's seen in other coronaviruses that relate to the common cold. So actually understanding this mm -hmm. process could be could pay out quite a lot of interesting insights to dividend on like other diseases. So I think that that's another important. So not just focusing on coronavirus, but also understanding understanding the immune system in more detail will help us deal with other viruses. That I mean, the oh, yeah, the sure. idea of like a, a cure for the common cold it comes that much closer the more we understand how coronaviruses work and how this sort of like de deficiency in immunity works because this is like an entirely new thing for for me. Well, yeah. So do you think that do you, do you think that this paper says anything about um, like a mechanism of the common cold, because like in the common cold, there's also the, oh, that's definitely known, right? There's a fast decrease yes. in antibodies. There's a lot of research say that like, the antibody load doesn't happen. Yeah. So could, yeah, yeah. Do you think that those mechanisms could be related? I mean, it's that's a total I shot mean, in the I, dark, but it like also makes a lot of sense, yeah. right? Like, cause there are related viruses. Yeah, this, this is part, partly like <laughs> think, partly hope. Like there's a, because mm. I mean, a lot of those cold, common cold viruses are themselves coronaviruses. So, the so I don't think it's that big a leap to say that they might operate the same mechanism. But it's still. But that speaks. That speaks. That speaks to a viral protein. Maybe that's doing this, yeah. right? Like something about coronaviruses, something they make. Yeah. Back to that paper that we chose. We were debating between this one and the ORF yes. nine one or whatever, right? Like, tell us more about those undescribed immunomodulatory. Yeah. Uh, ORFs inside of the virus, like maybe it's gonna it's gonna tell us something. But again, I I feel like that's also oh no, you know vaccines are good because they are they're helping direct the immune response in the absence of those viruses and those accessory yeah. viral proteins, right? So I, I reading this made me feel better about the vaccine in some ways because I'm like okay, right? Like people need this. Like well, first of all. It also like really emphasized the importance. Like we're not going to get, we may not get herd immunity just by being infected, <laughs> which is like so great yeah. that we didn't go. I mean, it was a horrible idea to think that you would get infected and then we'd have herd immunity because like just the cost oh, yeah. to the population. The infect them all and let God sort them out theory, which I thought was, yeah, was yeah, really. Yeah. I mean, this is this this is like the science too to say like, don't even talk about like the 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 harm that you would do to people by going down that route, it might not even have yeah. worked <laughs> because, because the immunity that's coming out, right. Is like still like not, may not be the best. Yeah, uh, exactly. Um, so I think this kind of like, it does shoot that whole you know, herd immunity argument a bit. And personally, for me, it, it doesn't so much make me feel more faith in vaccines. It makes me feel like it's a lot more of a lottery than the, like the, the, so mm -hmm. like the looking at, depending on what, so the hope is that, that there is such a diversity in the different types of vaccines that that at least one of them won't like cause this kind of response. So yeah, there, I mean, because because again, like so the, some so two of the vaccines are in the most latest stages of testing at the moment are both cell-based inactivated vaccine candidates. So this makes me feel mm -hmm. a, a little less kind of sanguine about those. Um, but mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. um, I. I am hopeful that, because again, the convalescent patients, they show a properly good response. So hopefully we know what a good response looks like now. We know what a bad coronavirus response looks like. So now that we're testing vaccines, hopefully we'll be able to pass that out and understand. Uh, and Right. And like, so we, because I think the nightmare would be to have a vaccine that creates the opposite response. That's so... I guess like one of the things though is like in the convalescent, right? Like the convalescent patients, like it's variable, yeah. right? Like some of them are going down like a strange yeah. path. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I guess that's where I'm like, yeah, I, the, those are the danger zones. But you know, you can't you can't design everything no. perfectly, right? Like, um, yeah, just understanding why something might go wrong though is really yeah. nice. Like if a vaccine trial doesn't work, 
you could also um, you could co- go back to this information. You could be like, oh, maybe this is why, and then that could inform the next, yeah. right? What might be the next best candidate? And yeah, I guess also like <clears> understanding because <throat> I think for adjuvant manufacturing, understanding all the little decisions that every part of the immune system makes is going to be quite important mm-hmm. in the future, and especially if you want to like be able to structure those into into a specific way and like kind of because mm-hmm. vaccines are about training the immune system and at the moment all we do is show them bits of the virus but what if we actually gave them proper hints like so, so, some way of manipulating cytokines or ways to like direct sure. it in a certain way now that, i'm going full blue sky crazy here but i feel like that's something that we'd want to do in the future so well i mean in some ways if 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 this virus um, has some mechanism to break up the germinal centers, I mean, breaking something can help understand how they exactly. form in the first place. Maybe it'll become maybe it'll become a research tool, right? And we'll learn more about germinal centers through yeah. this through this this understanding as well. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, so I think that 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 we. I would like. I think that. Sorry, I just want to say. I feel like that is setting up for a new, just not not SARS-CoV-2 model corona. Like maybe one of the coronaviruses, the common cold ones, could come into an immunological yeah. model and tell us about the immune system. If, if if it does the same thing, right? If they would go down that path and like, oh, this common cold one does this as well. So like, let's let's make a model out of that. <laughs> let's make a type of mouse that <laughs> always consistently gets broken. Um, germinal centers when infected by this coronavirus and then interrogate on the host and the pathogen yeah, side I mean, what goes into time that. Time to go to that hyper-mutated <clears throat> coronavirus for mice and see whether the, those, scoop out those symptoms and see whether the same thing's happening. I guess that's... Yeah, 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 absolutely. And, and then we can maybe get more of the steps yeah. along this process. Find, find mm-hmm. like, the various different mice that are mutants for different parts of their immune system and then just, like, see what happens yeah. and then yeah. develop a model and then find out it doesn't work in humans and go the cycle works goes over again. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I think that that's also, just to keep in mind, that, like, the markers that are discussed here, they were discussed because they're yeah. human markers. But that changes in oh, mice. Yeah. <laughs> like I think I was reading like CD twenty seven isn't uh isn't a memory marker in mice as much as it is in humans. Yeah, it, so it's uh, <clears throat> essentially I guess like not so much looking at the same markers, but looking at the, whether the same logic is still present in mice. Yeah, the logic. It's about the yeah, logic. To find yeah, out the logic mm-hmm. is still there, but we know that the markers will be different, and the but like they're <laughs> they're operating on the same tune, but they're playing a different, a different instrument. So it's yeah, yeah. Yeah, those same principles, right? Like how <laughs> that two factor. Yeah, yeah. You see patterns emerge, yeah. and, and that's the utility yeah, of this. That... And having this human data is a really great like uh, beginning point, right, to dive into yeah. those things. So <clears throat> yeah, I think that we've covered almost everything. It's this has been quite a, a, a yeah. lot longer than we usual, but uh, hopefully <laughs> it is. But yeah, it's been a big paper, and there's been quite a lot to talk about with it. So I mm-hmm. so. I think we I think we also just learned a lot and then we need to explain it all <laughs> to each other. <laughs> yeah. But uh yeah, if this is interesting if, if you've managed to stay through the whole thing, this is what we do when we dive into the journal articles. Um if there's a paper that you'd want us to dive into, let us know uh by tweeting us at the hashtag or at our handles. Um and join us next week where we will dive back into the headlines and try to choose the next thing to dive into. Yeah, thank you very much for listening. Bye. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> uh, yeah, thank you. That was a great sign out. Uh...